the truth will set you free. The truth will set you free. Hey guys, Peter Franson here from ChristianGeekCentral.com and Spirit Blade Productions. Right now, I'm going to attempt to examine the Bible and dissect some of the churchy language that's really easy for us to take for granted, digging into history and languages, as I'm able anyway, to try and get at the heart of the text so that we can hopefully see and apply at least some of what God has for you and me in these words today. Now, I'm not formally trained in Scripture. I'm just a guy using resources and a questioning mind to try and get at the truth, and that's something that we can all do, so I hope you'll do that with me. We've been studying our way through the book of Philippians and have arrived now at chapter 4, verses 10 through 13, which in the ESV reads, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. With verse 10, Paul begins the closing section now of his letter, uh, although there seems to be some transitional continuity, I think. In verses 4 through 9, Paul urged his readers to rejoice in the Lord always and to develop a number of elements in their thought lives and perspectives in the midst of hardship. That was the context for them. And now as Paul begins to close his letter, he shares what he has personally found to rejoice in the Lord over, despite his imprisonment and hardship. Verse 10 again, he says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Now, evidently, the church at Philippi had wanted to send assistance to Paul, but were not able to until recently. The Greek word for revived here is very rare and is more literally translated as to shoot up, to sprout again, grow green again, flourish again. Considering this and Paul's clarification that the issue was opportunity and not desire, it seems as though Paul's rejoicing that when given the opportunity, the Philippians gave action to their concern for him. Their concern for him uh, flourished and sprouted and, and shot up, you know, like a, like a, uh, like a, a flourishing plant. So Paul's focus doesn't seem to be on benefiting from the gift, but that, that they were maturing and prioritizing the care of others. It reminds me of uh, years ago when I first started doing a caroling ministry at our church, and uh, specifically each year during Christmas, we visit and give gift bags to those in our church community who are just going through really difficult circumstances in life. And we visited an elderly woman, and after we'd finished caroling and given her the gift bag and everybody was getting back to their cars to go to the next person, you know, she kind of uh, uh, <clears throat> said to me specifically, good for you for doing this kind of thing, you know. And I was thinking to myself, well, we hopefully it was good for you. I mean, we, we came to, to bless you and stuff, but but she was in a place of maturity in her faith where the thing that was on her mind at that time was seeing my spiritual growth in, in starting a ministry like this, you know. And so I think that's kind of what Paul is going on, what, what's going on with Paul here is that he's in this place of spiritual maturity, which, yes, of course, I'm sure he was ap appreciative and grateful and enjoyed and, and benefited from, is maybe a better way to say it, the gifts and the support that they had sent. But foremost on his mind right now is it was so cool for him to see this church in Philippi uh, confirming their concern for him and really taking action and not just letting their their faith and their values be a matter of what was going on in their hearts and minds, but something that actually sprung into action in life. Uh, okay, verses 11 and 13, or 11 through 13 again, say, uh, not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I always want more from verse 13. I can do all things from, through him who strengthens me. I mean, first off, I, I think I, uh, at some point in, for, in er, my early years, uh, I was under the impression, maybe, I don't know, maybe if you had this impression too, but this phrase, I can do all things through him who strengthens me, um, it often is used in a context of people like 
you know, making them bold so that they can take on what seems to be impossible. Like God is going to give them super strength to achieve what they ordinarily would not be able to achieve. But the context here um, really is more about the manner in which we experience things in life. We can do all things in our own strength and in our own efforts and experience, you know, the, the crap that comes from that. Or we can do all things in life through Christ and the strength that he gives us through the Holy Spirit. Um, but back to my uh, initial thought there, I, I always want more from this verse. In verses 11 through 12, we read words that leave us on the edge of our seats because they sound so alien. That Maybe especially to us as geeks. I mean, here's a person who is truly content no matter what he has or doesn't have. Uh, and contentment is something, I mean, we tend to be materialistic, if we're honest, and be drawn toward acquiring things as geeks. Uh, and we can be discontent when those things let us down or when we can't acquire them. And he's not, Paul isn't merely talking about doing without nice creature comforts and freaking entertainment. He was enduring true suffering. And yet he says he's learned the secret of being content, even in those times. The secret being that he has learned that he can do all things in life through Christ, through the Spirit who gives him the strength that he needs. Uh, what does that look like? I always want to ask myself, what form does that take? We don't get those answers here. I really wish we did. One observation we can make is that it is something that can be learned. It's not natural and automatic, nor is it promised to be every believer's experience. Paul says, I have learned the secret. Now, was that through study of God's word, personal reflection, or just the hard school of experience? Maybe it was one or all of those things. We just aren't told here. I've never truly suffered in life, but I've talked to Christians who have and who have told me that God provided the strength they needed in those times. But it's difficult usually for them to go into any more detail than that. And that's frustrating to me because as someone who worries what horrible things may come in my life, I have a great imagination for that, maybe you do too, wondering if I will fall into inescapable despair or depression when they come, you know, I want more clarity about how God can be my strength if and when those times arrive. And I just don't find that clarity here or anywhere else I know of in Scripture. But I do find reason to hope and maybe a hint in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, also written by Paul, where Paul and the Spirit write, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Given that despair and fear are both ultimately sin, the promise I take from this verse is that when we are in circumstances that might tempt us to sins like fear or despair, God also provides an escape route, not from the circumstances. He may at times, but that's not what the promise is here. He's promising an escape route from the sin. Uh, what form that might take is not specified, likely because it will differ based on each situation and person. Maybe it will be an action we can choose or a truth we can focus on, but in some way it will give us what we need to endure. The only question is whether or not we will willingly look for and then choose the escape from sin that God provides. Uh, there's still a lot of mystery here as I wonder how these verses uh, in um, Philippians may play out at some point in my life, but I, I take what I can from the promises in these words and in, uh, from 1 Corinthians, endeavoring to trust that for every trial I might face, God will provide what I need. Um, it might be like the manna that he gave to the Israelites. You know, he's not going to give more than I need. He's not going to give me in advance what I need for tomorrow or for the event that arrives. It's not going to give me my portion before I actually need it, but for the needs of each day, God will provide what I need, what we need to endure. And it seems to me in looking at these verses that our role is to keep a watchful eye out for it and take it when it presents itself. 
If you'd like some help finding a good church in your area, I would love to help you do that if I can. Online resources and communities are good supplements, but by nature they just can't speak to your particular situation like relationships in a local church can. The context for almost everything in the New Testament assumes that we're serving and building purposeful relationships in a local church. So whether you're in a church that just kind of lacks Bible-based intentionality or maybe not attending any church at all, if I can help you get connected to an authentic, compassionate, Bible-oriented church, I want to do that. Uh, you can email me at paeter at spiritblade.com, and we can look at some websites of churches in your area together.